you give me a thumbs up if you can see these? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, as I said in the introduction, uh, my name is Alistair Henry. I'm the Senior Research Manager here at Big Health, primarily focused on our Sleepio products, which I'll be uh, delving into more today. But I want to spend some time today walking you through kind of where we're at in the field of digital therapeutics and where we might be going, um, given that while, yes, digital therapeutics have been around for approximately 10 years, I uh, really feel that in the grand scheme of things, that's not all that long. So before we get started, as I'm sure you'll have gathered by now, yes, I am employed by Big Health, so I want to state that up front, and I'm also a shareholder in Big Health, and we are the company that um, has developed Sleepio. So I know that many of us are familiar with insomnia, and I presume most of you will be, but I want to give a, a quick refresher to anyone that, that isn't all that familiar. So firstly, we know that sleep difficulties are common in the population. Um, uh, between 10 and 40% of the population have sleep difficulty of some kind, depending on, on uh, the, the study used. But we also see that 10 to 15% have insomnia disorder. And we can really uh, consider insomnia as having um, a core set of, of symptoms, uh, both affecting nighttime and daytime. Uh, for the nighttime, the, the difficulties primarily experienced are difficulties initiating sleep, maintaining sleep, or early morning awakening with an inability to return to sleep. But of course, it's only considered insomnia disorder, one, when it meets the criteria around um, how frequently it occurs and the chronicity of the problem, but also it has to have those accompanying daytime impairments. So that could be things like fatigue, irritability, um, you have uh, high rates of, of absenteeism, reduced productivity at work, uh, definitely maintaining social relationships. And I think when we consider that this whole picture of insomnia, of both those nighttime symptoms and daytime symptoms, we could really uh, think of insomnia as a 24 hour disorder. And it is really those daytime problems that drive help seeking in patients. But then if we think beyond that kind of day-to-day -day experience of insomnia, for it is the nighttime sleep difficulties and the, 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 the daytime impairments, uh, insomnia over time can actually pose a risk to individuals' health. Uh, it can uh, increase the risk of developing mental health uh, disorders and chronic physical health conditions. And some of the great work by Elizabeth Hertenstein has shown uh, in, in a recent meta-analysis that the presence of insomnia doubles the risk of, of developing depression and triples the risk of developing anxiety. And some of the other work conducted by, by a range of researchers has also shown that over time, the presence of insomnia can increase risk of both diabetes and cardiovascular disease, amongst many others. So I think then when we think about the whole picture of insomnia, um, it goes beyond that, that daytime um, kind of lived experience of it. And it shows that we do need to be potentially looking to see how can we address this early, given these long term risks. So throughout the past 15 years, treatment guidelines have uh, recommended cognitive behavioural therapy as the first line treatment for insomnia. Um, and as we have here, we've got some of the, the recent iterations of these guidelines issued by the American College of Physicians, the European Sleep Research Society, the British Association of Psychopharmacology and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And all of these guidelines unequivocally recommend CBT as the first line treatment. And this is now based on, on many decades of research so that the, these recommendations uh, are strong and are based on at least moderate quality to high quality evidence. But th this is uh, already built on, I think it was in 1999, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine first issued um, a, a practice update that, that alluded to some of the, the components that are now um, uh, almost taken as a standard within CBT. So there has been that history really going beyond the past uh, kind of 15 years. So. Cognitive behavioral therapy, as we know, is a multi-component treatment. Um, it typically lasts between four and eight sessions in the context of insomnia and seeks to address those cognitive and behavioral factors that drive and underpin and maintain insomnia. And it can take a variety of formats. Typically, it is one-to-one, uh, -one, so patient meeting with a therapist or psychologist. Uh, there can also be group therapy, self-help books, and of course, uh, taking uh, or providing digital formats, which I'll be covering today. And it really comprises of kind of five key components of which I've got a, a brief overview here. So firstly, cognitive therapy, which seeks to challenge those dysfunctional beliefs and attitudes about sleep. Sleep hygiene, which are a set of recommendations that promote healthy sleep habits. Stimulus control, which are instructions to reduce the association between um, the bed and arousal and try and strengthen those connections between the bed and sleep. Sleep restriction, which is a restriction and standardization of the time in bed to help increase sleep drive and also stabilize the circadian rhythm. And then finally, relaxation techniques that aim to reduce arousal and facilitate sleep. So this could be a progressive muscle relaxation or even in some cases, autogenic training. 
but I'd like to take us back now probably around 150 years um, because I, I would almost like to argue that the underlying principles of CBT are not a recent concept when applied to insomnia despite the the kind of field making clear statements on it released since 1999. So what I have here on the far left is an article from 19, 1878 published in The Lancet, the one in the middle published in The Lancet in I think 1892 and the, the article on the right published in the California State Journal of Medicine, and apologies, I don't have the year uh, for that one. But these are case reports of patients with insomnia, and I'm going to read through some of the excerpts from them, and I think you could all be uh, kind of mistaken to think that these aren't from patients that were seen in a, in a clinic today. Um, but I'd like you to think, as I'm, as I'm reading through some of these, some of the underpinnings that you're seeing here around the, the kind of cognitive impact, the, the emotional impact, and the, the behavioral factors that, that are clearly at play, um, as we know all too well. So the first one, very often the surest way of keeping awake is to try hard to get to sleep. We do most things best when we forget ourselves. Uh, going to sleep is no exception to the rule. And then he has tried everything. He has denied himself his afternoon nap in order to secure his sleep at night. He has darkened his room and closed his eyes, has lighted his candle and read his book. He has tried counting, repeating, saying his prayers. He has followed the ticking of the clock and thought of the humming of bees. He has tried a multitude of drugs, for some of which he has an intolerance by idiosyncrasy. He spends his day in dread expectation of the coming sleepless night. Should he happen to sleep soon after lying down, he invariably wakes up in an hour or so. And then finally, insomnia, in other words, is not just sleeplessness, but sleeplessness to which anxiety and fear in regard to its effects, as well as uh, frenzied efforts to eradicate it are added. So while, yes, CBT was not really existing, thing in the, the form it currently does here at this time. I think we can see here some of those cognitive and behavioral factors at play and, and the narrative is beginning to, to focus on how it's these things like putting in uh, effortful processes, um, changing in your behavior in, in response to poor sleep to try and remedy that and it's clearly not working. So then if we think about that historical context going back 150 years where those case reports are, are clearly conveying uh, some of the, the current underpinning and current thinking we have around insomnia, but also with the treatment guidelines, which, uh, as I said, unequivocally recommend CBT for insomnia as the first line treatment. Unfortunately, that isn't the reality. We know that barriers prevent access to and provision of CBT at scale for many individuals. So because of this, uh, patients and providers are left with very few options. So we, we have data from primary care showing that uh, GPs or primary care physicians, uh, 84 to 87 percent of them provide side hypnotic as standard, and 88 percent also provide sleep hygiene. And we know that from the the medication side, we know that medication, yes, while it can bring short term benefits, one is not recommended. Two poses risk of harms um, and dependency, which we'll get to in a bit. So then the other alternative, sleep hygiene. We know that sleep hygiene, yes, is a part of CBT for insomnia. But as a standalone interven intervention, it is not effective at improving sleep meaningfully. But then if we look at the, the, the overall picture, there is uh, some great recent data published in the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine by Kaufman et al., which shows a gradual reduction in the prescription of sed sedative hypnotics. And while the reasons for this aren't clear, it may be because of, over the past couple of years, there's been greater awareness of the harms posed by, by uh, sleep medication, uh, as made clear by the FDA and their black box warning for Ambien. Um, but also, I think at the, the public level, there's a greater awareness of, of sleep medication not being the, the best approach. But given that there doesn't seem to be anything that people are then being provided uh, in lieu of these, what we've also seen is recent data um, coming out, I think, from the CDC, uh, showing an increase in the use of, of uh, self-medication efforts. So this is in, in the US, particularly melatonin, um, including in younger adults. And we're seeing this um, unsupervised, unregulated use of melatonin. And while, yes, it's generally considered safer than, than most sedative hypnotics, you are actually seeing an, an uptick in uh, hospitalization issues, particularly in younger individuals who are ingesting it in quite large quantities. But even when you think about the whole population, melatonin, as we know, is also not that effective for improving insomnia. So then let's take a step back from primary care and go towards psychologists, given that psychologists are the ones that typically provide CBT for insomnia. So recent data published by the American uh, Psychological Association in their 2022 COVID-19 impact uh, survey showed that psychologists are still struggling to meet the demand of patients across the board. Each psychologist on average is seeing 15 new inbound requests for care each week. And of those surveyed as part of the, this uh, publication, 
60% have no new openings for any patients. 46% feel as though they can't meet demand. And as we saw during the pandemic, when there was widespread shutdowns across the globe, many psychologists to maintain their clinical practice had to switch to resources such as uh, telehealth. And we find that 96% of psychologists are still intending to use that, of course, because that overcomes some of the barriers that patients often face, uh, obtaining CBT largely around a geographical location or a remoteness from, from care. But then if we think about the picture here, where this is surveyed across all psychologists who are seeing patients with a range of diagnoses and clinical complaints, we know that not all therapists and psychologists are trained in CBT for insomnia. So if we pull that back and narrow this down, to the group of therapists that are trained in doing so. We can see that they're not coping with the, the level of patients at, at the global level. So how would they be able to cope with the level of patients that, uh, if they're just treating patients with insomnia, even in the midst of using something like telehealth, which at least breaks down some of those barriers? So of course we can see that as we all are, all humans have a finite amount of time they can dedicate to, to work each day and to engaging in, uh, in this case in therapy. So I think we can consider it now based on the data recently published um, by the Kaufman et al. paper in Journal of Clinical Sleep Me uh, Medicine and this, uh, uh, this uh, report from the APA, that the problem therefore is maybe not over prescribing of medication anymore, but rather under provision or lack of access to evidence-based CBT. So if we think about then, how can we treat insomnia at scale? So here I have the, the, the standard approach that has really been uh, the, the, the the primary point that, that many people would uh, get in a, a primary care practice or, or when they see their GP. So most people would go in would likely get medication, which of course are scalable because it's easy to roll them out. It'd be a fast, maybe five, max 10 minute appointment. They're affordable. They're generally quite cheap given that many of the, the medications are now available in, in generic formats. Um, they're also consistent given that uh, at the end of the day, a pharmaceutical product is made up of, of chemicals. They, they tend to be able to have a pretty consistent response across, albeit with variations in, in certain uh, age groups. Uh, and they're also evidence-based. Yes, while they're not recommended for the treatment of chronic insomnia, and they don't tend to have long-term uh, beneficial effects, we do see in the short term, at least, uh, some benefits uh, associated with medication. But then if we think about this in the, the, the lens of the, the, the kind of wider considerations, that they're against treatment guidelines. Uh, they're not preferred by patients who often report preferring psychosocial-based approaches to treatment. They're associated with safety concerns and also risk of dependency. So then if we think about that in the, 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 the wider context, that they don't sound like a great option, but as we're seeing, it's maybe all that people have. But what if I were to propose that we substitute drugs out for digital therapeutics, which I would argue are scalable uh, in certain contexts. They're also affordable. They have a consistent effect and they're also evidence-based. And during this presentation today, I want to take you through each of those kind of four considerations and, and look to see what evidence there is to support those. But also when we, we consider CBT delivered digitally uh, as, as a digital therapeutic, they are concordant with treatment guidelines because they're providing CBT. They're preferred by patients by providing a, a psychosocial intervention and also that um, data uh, does suggest that patients do enjoy using digital therapeutics as a means of treatment in some capacity. And they also, compared to medication, have favorable safety profile, and they also, by the nature of CBT, have long-term efficacy. So enter in digital CBT for insomnia. So we can break down digital CBT for insomnia into kind of three distinct buckets. Um, the first being digital CBT as support. So this would be an app or program that supports conventional therapy where a patient might go and see a psychologist on a weekly basis, but they have this app in their pocket they can take home that helps them between sessions. So that could be doing things like give them a couple little tips around sleep hygiene. They can fill out their sleep diaries on there. There's other informational materials there, but there's not really any real automation to that, that program. It still requires the full clinician involvement to obtain a treatment effect. And by that nature, it's, it's still limited in terms of its scalability because it still requires a therapist to be available to guide that, that individual through therapy. The next step would be guided uh, digital CBT. So there would be uh, digital CBT that is automated with guidance from a therapist or a coach or a technician. So the, the patient would be working through this on a week-by-week week basis, week basis. They'd have access to tools uh, during the, those time periods, but they still have routine check-ins. have access to tools during those time periods, but they still have routine check-ins. So while there's that partial automation there and there's some of the therapeutic content delivered within the app, uh, there's still the requirement of a clinician being involved to, to help guide them through that, that process. 
So again, while that frees up more clinician time, it still is not entirely scalable because as I said, as human beings, we all have limited hours and, and availability for what we can do and how many patients anyone could see in, in a given week. And then finally, at the, the far right end, we have fully automated digital CBT. So this would be a platform that is entirely fully automated. It requires no human input or support. And the individual's experience is tailored to them based on information they provide, that then using algorithms is personalized to them. And this is therefore fully scalable because it's not requiring on the availability or dependent on the availability of a therapist or clinician or technician or coach. And this is what I'll focus on more today. Um, examples of fully automated digital CBT are, of course, our program, Sleepio, and another program called Somris, developed by Pair Therapeutics, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. So firstly, can we just say in a broad statement whether digital CBT for insomnia is effective? Uh, I would say that that's quite clear now. We have a number of meta-analyses conducted really over the past six years that consistently demonstrate the effectiveness of digital CBT for insomnia, showing large between-group effect sizes on measures of insomnia severity, such as the insomnia severity index and the sleep condition indicator, and also medium to large effects on sleep diary outcomes. And I think when we look at the, the broader picture here of what we're seeing in the meta-analyses, but also some other work that, that's been recently done, I think we can confidently say that, that results show that digital CBT for insomnia is almost, if not equivalently, effective to face-to-face -face CBT. But I think there is still some work to be done around there. But I think broadly, as I'm saying, based on the evidence, we can say quite confidently that we're, we're seeing similar effects um, for, for both digital and in-person formats. So Sleepio, this is our, our program that, that, that we've developed for insomnia disorder. Sleepio has been around now for around 11 years, and what it does is it delivers tailored behavioral medicine that harnesses cognitive behavioral therapy techniques similar to those that I, I described earlier. So it's fully automated, as I said, there's no dependency on human therapists or coaches, and that means a consistent and accessible approach uh, and treatment for people, where an individual can log into Sleepio at any time of the day that they want if they're lying there at night struggling to sleep, they can actually get help in the moment to do things like uh, progressive muscle relaxation or, or get some su support as needed. And it also means that there is that time between sessions that you get within uh, in-person therapy, as we know across mental health disorders, where the individual attend a session one week, but actually they, they, they tend to have quite poor memory for what occurred in that session and for the techniques that they were taught in that session, which makes it all that more harder to uh, implement those between the, 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 the sessions. And I think if we can put it simply, we could almost see it as um, implementation equals effectiveness. We, of course, need to be implementing cognitive therapeutic techniques for, in order for someone to see benefit. Another thing that Sleepio does is it has engaging animation. Uh, of course, you want any kind of app. All of us will be have, have endless apps on our phone that we use. In order for you to keep using them, it has to be engaging. And that, that's one of the key considerations within Sleepio. And it also has a powerful feedback loop built into it for it is tailored on not only sleep diary responses that users provide, but also based on standardized measures that are asked during sign up and throughout the program to ensure that their experience is most relevant to them. And Sleepio is structured around six sessions and is delivered by a virtual therapist known as the prof. So as I said, the, the techniques really within Sleepio are what you would get within in-person CBT. It's still using those key evidence-based therapeutic uh, components. So these include psychoeducation and goal setting, sleep hygiene, stimulus control, sleep restriction therapy, and cognitive te techniques to challenge some of those kind of unhelpful uh, beliefs and attitudes that, that we so often see uh, as, a, as a key marker in insomnia. So really over the past 11 years of Sleepio's existence, uh, we have sought to collect a, a wealth of data evaluating Sleepio in a range of clinical groups, clinical settings, and using a variety of research designs. And this has been undertaken in collaboration with a number of, of international collaborators. And to name a few, this includes Chris Drake, Philip Cheng, David Kambach at Henry Ford Health System, Simon Kyle and his team at the University of Oxford, Jen Felder at UCSF, and many others. And over the past 11 years, we've managed to accrue over 40 peer-reviewed published evidence papers evaluating Sleepio's effects, 13 of which are randomized controlled trials and uh, 28,000 participants across all of those 40 plus studies. So it's really been uh, no easy feat, but it's something that we've dedicated um, our approach to. We want to ensure that we are rigorously testing uh, Sleepio in the same way that you'd expect any pharmaceutical to be uh, evaluated or any medical device to be evaluated. So now if we kind of consider this across a very kind of simplistic um, spectrum from efficacy through to effectiveness and beyond, so really 
uh, taking a, a simple view of the kind of clinical trial phases. We have shown that Sleepio is safe and efficacious. Um, we've shown that it's generalizable based on recent data that's currently under review, led by my, my colleague, Chris Miller. Uh, we've also evaluated the effects of Sleepio on those daytime symptoms of impairments and insomnia, uh, and also evaluated its effects by improving sleep. What does that confer on broader mental health? And then now more so as we're moving towards the far right end of the spectrum, we're looking at, to understand is Sleepio cost effective? Yes, we know that it works clinically, but of course, for an intervention to be taken up in a healthcare system, the main thing they care about beyond clinical effects are whether it delivers value for money for them. So I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation kind of delving into each of these studies here to give you a, 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 an idea of the, the kind of life cycle of where we're at with, with Sleepio research. So if we go back in time to 2012, um, when Colin Espy was still based at the University of Glasgow, they conducted their first ever RCT of Sleepio. And this is a placebo-controlled trial where individuals were randomized to one of three arms, those being Sleepio, a psychological placebo, which for all intents and purposes was an app that was developed that looked identical to Sleepio. But instead, what it did is it had no therapeutic content. It was, it was entirely neutral content within that, that uh, program. And then finally, the third arm was a usual care arm where individuals were um, able to use their any care that they were, were currently receiving. So 164 individuals with insomnia were randomized uh, and the, the primary outcome was sleep efficiency evaluated uh, immediately post-intervention and then again, uh, follow up eight weeks later. And what we found that, of course, sleep led to significant improvements in sleep efficiency with large between group effects compared to both uh, psycho, uh, sorry, placebo and usual care. Um, and then for other uh, key components, so wake after sleep onset and sleep onset latency defined by sleep diaries, we saw medium to large effects for those, again, with statistical significance in favour of sleepio. And also in this study, there was secondary outcomes looking at standardised measures of insomnia severity and also a couple of uh, items relating to daytime dysfunction where we did see superiority for sleepio. So this was really the first test of sleepio um, in a, an RCT setting. And we found that at post-intervention, 76% uh, of those in the Sleepio group achieved healthy sleep efficiency, defined as having a sleep efficiency of 80% or greater, compared to 29% in the placebo um, and 18% for usual care. And this study is what we believe to be the first ever uh, study evaluating a digital therapeutic against a psychological placebo control. So that study showed that Sleepio works to improve sleep, but as I mentioned, Insomnia is more than that. Insomnia also uh, has to all of those daytime impairments uh, and issues with day-to-day with -day functioning that, that, that patients report. So in 2019, um, Colin and his team at Oxford, led by Anne-Marie Lewick, uh, conducted another, another RCT, this time looking at sleep heal compared to a sleep hygiene control um, and 1,711 participants with insomnia who were randomized either to sleep heal plus usual care or online sleep hygiene uh, education. Uh, versus, uh, compared, sorry, again, with, with usual care in that arm as well. And the primary outcomes were uh, health, psychological well-being, and sleep-related quality of life. And again, what we found here is that compared to control, Slipio led to uh, statistically significant benefits uh, on all those outcomes in favour of Slipio, uh, with small effects on well-being and health and large effects on sleep-related quality of life. But we want to dig into this a bit further and understand, okay, well, yes, we're seeing Slipio and digital CBT improving these outcomes, but could it be that these outcomes are improving because of the, the benefits that we're seeing in sleep? So we conducted a mediation analysis and found that the benefits occurring in insomnia at mid-intervention explained the benefits occurring in these primary outcomes uh, at post-intervention. So we found that imp improvements in insomnia mediated improvements in well-being, physical health, and sleep related quality of life with a percentage of between 45.5 to 84%. So we're seeing that by improving insomnia, that's the pathway by which we're leading and seeing these, these kind of more distal benefits and these daytime symptoms. So I've continued really to build on this, uh, capitalize on, on large amounts of data that we have, and also want to kind of answer questions that are of relevance to the field. We know, as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, that insomnia often uh, at least either co-presents or is a risk factor for the development of uh, other uh, comorbid uh, mental health conditions. So for this study, what we did is we combined data from that previous study, the 1,711 participants from SB et al 2019, with 3,755 participants from the Freeman et al OASIS trial, which evaluated Sleepio in uh, university students. So we combined both of those data sets still in a controlled format. 
uh, but only included those in the sub-analysis, uh, those who had, of course, insomnia, as was required for entry into both of those trials, but also clinically significant depressive symptoms um, as well. And that led to us to having a sample uh, from those combined studies of 3,352 participants. And what we found is that Sleepio led to significant improvements in sleep with a medium effect size and uh, significant improvements in depressive symptoms, again, compared to control with a small effect size. But what, again, we wanted to see is by targeting sleep, could that serve as a transdiagnostic uh, uh, treatment target to improve broader mental health? And again, we conduct another mediation analysis and find that improvements in sleep at mid-treatment explained 87% of sleep effect on depressive symptoms at post-treatment. So again, we're seeing that not only by targeting uh, sleep are we improving their, of course, any sleep complaint or insomnia symptoms, but we're having these uh, more kind of distal impacts on uh, other areas that, that often are, are issues in insomnia. And we do also currently have data on this that we're closest to make to a journal showing equivalent results for those with insomnia and clinically significant anxiety um, on anxiety outcomes as well. But then, as, a, as I mentioned on that uh, diagram showing the, the side from efficacy to effectiveness, one of the things we want to understand are the effects generalizable. And because we've been able to conduct very large studies of Sleepio, uh, these studies also provide us the, the, the ideal setting to understand the moderators of treatment effectiveness for a standardized digital CBT program in a very large sample size. So we, we started to do exa exactly that and understand who responds to digital CBT. So in an RCT, a baseline variable is called a moderator when the effect of the treatment on the outcome differs based on the value of that variable. So we sought to understand and based on clinical and demographic variables that we have across these studies, whether any of those moderated the effectiveness of Sleepio to understand if Sleepio worked better for certain groups uh, or subgroups in the population. So what we did is we combined data and individual participant data from 12 of our published RCTs, uh, which led to us having a, a total of 8,549 participants who received either Sleepio or a control condition. And we harmonized the data sets across all of those, um, so ensuring that we had uh, all the relevant clinical and demographic variables to combine and harmonize those. And the primary outcome here was evaluating symptoms of insomnia measured by continuous validated scales, such as the SCI and the ISI. And working with a team at King's College London, we used novel and robust statistical approaches developed originally by Richard Riley to, to help us understand uh, what variables and values might, might moderate the on insomnia. So here we have on the right the forest plot from that, and apologies, I know the, the text is very small, uh, but what we did is we found, first of all, across all of the groups, that digital CBT, i.e. Sleepio, had a large effect for symptoms of insomnia with Cohen's D of 1. Then if we look in that red box that you've now seen highlighted on the screen, um, we can see that for all of these subgroups, Sleepio outperformed the control. So there was no group or subgroup that uh, Sleepio did not work for in some capacity. Um, and we did find that Sleepio was more effective than control uh, for all subgroups, but there were differences within those subgroups once you, you dug into it. So in the blue here, you can see uh, places where there was some form of moderation. So individuals who were older, for example, had higher incomes identified as white or Asian experienced greater effects. But we did also find that participant sex, education and employment status did not moderate the effect of Sleepio on insomnia symptoms. So what we can see is, yes, while there are differences here, which I think are important for us to consider clinically when people are making decisions around um, how and in what manner CBT for insomnia should be provided, we can see that actually there's nothing here saying that people shouldn't be getting CBT for insomnia. It, it shows that it does work for all, again, different levels in some subgroups there. So now that we've understood the, the effect that Sleepio is safe and effective and that the effects are also generalizable, one thing I want to kind of plant in everyone's minds is understanding, well, what is digital medicine? What are digital therapeutics? Because I think there's a lot of confusion in the field and I want to make a clear differentiation between evidence-based interventions and evidence-informed interventions. I think particularly in uh, the consumer market, there's a, a lot of confusion between a digital therapeutic um, per se and then a wellness app. Um, oftentimes people will say, I've been using X app to improve my sleep when we know that there's no evidence behind it. And although kind of individuals and companies set out with good intentions, digital interventions should not really be provided to, to patients prior to having established clinical safety and efficacy. And this is where I want to make a clear distinction between evidence-based and evidence-informed. 
So an evidence-based intervention would be any candidate digital therapeutic that would have to undergo rigorous clinical testing and demonstrate safety and efficacy for it to be evidence-based. But also it has to, through those findings, establish credibility to both patients and providers who will be the key stakeholders involved in, in providing or using that digital therapeutic. But it also has to offer clinically meaningful benefits. I know a lot of us, when we're thinking about research design, we're really focused on statistical significance. But we also should be thinking about clinical significance beyond that to ensure that we are moving those clinically relevant endpoints. For as we can think of evidence in, informed by the, the statement here, where in-person CBT treats insomnia, my app uses CBT, therefore my app treats insomnia effectively. I'd argue that, that, that that's definitely not evidence-based because all you're saying is it works in this setting, I'm going to play with it in this and then say that it works. And for us, we need to be setting higher standards. Um, and as the title of this uh, slide says, that digital medicine does need to work. Uh, so Colin Espy, along with John Torres and Troy Brennan, set out quite a simple framework uh, to help us understand and, and guide any evidence standards for digital therapeutics. Because digital therapeutics should not be subject to any less scrutiny than, say, a medication or medical device. I'm pretty sure none of us would want to take a medication um, if we didn't know whether it worked or not. Um, so we need to test any digital therapeutic rigorously to ensure it's, as I said, efficacy and safety for end users. Uh, so here they, they laid out the, the, the what framework, which is firstly, the therapeutic has to work. So efficacy is supported by adequately powered RCTs. It also has to help. So not only do we have to see those statistically significant differences, but also uh, have those on clinically meaningful uh, endpoints and show differences there also between an intervention and control. It also has to be accessible. So it has to have a reliable and acceptable patient experience that is really addressing their needs and allows them to use it in a manner that, that is functional and uh, is easy to use. Um, that way, also, you should be thinking about the broader picture, so we need to have capacity to scale effectively uh, and safely. And also, the therapeutic has to be trusted, so it has to adhere to local clinical governance and uh, data and risk requirements, and also privacy requirements and international guidelines around information storage and data transfer. So it, it isn't an, an easy kind of bar to set, and it shouldn't be. We want to ensure that everything is, is working as it should be and adhering to all of the the requirements that it needs to, and to reiterate again for the second time, digital medicine needs to work. So recently we had some success with Sleepio, where Sleepio uh, recently became the first ever digital therapeutic to receive uh, guidance from the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence here in the UK, which confirmed its clinical and cost effectiveness within the healthcare system, this being the NHS. So we got a, a, a very nice uh, pride of place on the, the front cover of the Times right next to uh, the Duchess of Cambridge and Tom Cruise. So as you can all imagine, we we're very pleased with this when, when uh, we found out. And some of this work was based on a lot of the health economic work that, again, my, my colleague Chris Miller, along with collaborators of the Office of Health Economics and also University of Oxford, have been undertaking to answer those questions. Um, does Sleep Fuel provide value for money? So uh, a couple of years ago, Sleep Fuel was provided freely to all 2.7 million individuals in the Thames Valley region of England. As part of a collaboration with the Oxford Academic Health Sciences Network and Innovate UK. And based on those data, the team were interested to understand uh, the impact of sleepio on primary care costs. Of course, that's for many uh, people with insomnia tend to present. So they looked at data before and after sleepio was rolled out and, and used routinely collected data within GP consultations, so number of GP contacts, prescriptions to evaluate average costs. And data were obtained over 117 weeks. So that was one year prior to the rollout of Sleepio and five quarters after the rollout. And the figure on the right here shows the total cost associated with GP contacts uh, and with prescriptions on an average uh, basis of per person per week. And the vertical line uh, just around week 52 is the Sleepio rollout and the horizontal black line is a basic, basic fitting model for the trends and costs. So what, what do we find? So you can see in the table on the left, um, we, we, we can see different time points and that this shows the, the cost savings uh, obtained by those who had access to Sleepio. Bear in mind, this wasn't people who used Sleepio, but the population that, that was covered by Sleepio. So using estimates, it was shown how much Sleepio saved compared to if Sleepio was not available. And savings within the follow-up period, um, uh, 65 weeks, amounted to £6.64 per person. So then what the team did is they wanted to understand, firstly, how would that look if it was extrapolated to the whole of England? And this uh, led to a cost saving uh, when extrapolated to, to all of England using conservative estimates of $30.6 million over a 65-week period. 
But then what they also did is they wanted to see, okay, further down the line, how would this look? So two, three years out, would we see um, any, any kind of benefits there from a, an economic perspective? So you can see in the figure on the right, you have the blue line, which was the anticipated cost of users did not, or individuals did not have access to Sleepio. And the line in the red is where people did have, if they did have access to Sleepio. And you see that going out to two years and then beyond and then the table to three years, you are seeing those costs continuing to be, cost savings continuing to be maintained. So we find here that uh, Sleepio did redu reduce costs associated with GP contact and prescriptions in a primary care setting. And another um, area that, that has been of interest related to health economics is um, qualities, which are quality adjusted life years, which is uh, a measure that's calculated from health quality of life measures in our evaluation of therapeutics and health technology assessments. So a quality is a composite measure of the length and quality of someone's life, and it can be used to compare outcomes across a broad range of disease areas and groups. And NICE uses these in the UK to understand whether a treatment represents good value for money. So as I said, they're not only just interested in understanding, hey, is this uh, uh, an effective treatment? They want to understand, is it going to be um, a good decision economically? So this is therefore uh, an, uh, a mode of understanding whether a treatment is worth its cost. So studies have found gains in qualities with therapists delivered and therapists guided CBT for insomnia, but in most reports, these gains have not been statistically significant. And this is a concern given CBT is the first line recommended treatment for insomnia. So what we did in this study is we, um, in collaboration with Elizabeth Stokes at the University of Oxford, used data from the SBATAL 2019 RCT of those 1,711 participants um, and uh, aimed to understand uh, if SLIPIO led to gains in qualities uh, over time. So we use the data from the PROMISE 10 collected there and converted it to EQ 5D scores, which can then be further transformed into qualities. And we had a controlled follow up in that study of 24 weeks and uncontrolled at 48 weeks. And we found if we go uh, directly to the, the bottom row of, of that, that table, you can see from zero to 48 weeks, we saw a significant uh, gain in qualities for the, the sleep group of 0 0.026, which when you extrapolate that back, that equals uh, 9.5 days in perfect health. Uh, so we're seeing that with Sleepio, uh, over the, the long term, you are seeing gains um, almost a year out from when someone started uh, that leads to them having a, a kind of better quality um, and length of life. Um, so again, further demonstrating its value for money. But what does the future look like? Because now we've established um, efficacy, kind of effectiveness, now cost effectiveness. So let's see how does this uh, get rolled out in the real world. So in October 2021, Big Health partnered with the Scottish Government and the NHS to integrate both of our digital mental health uh, treatments within clinical practices nationwide. So this includes Sleepio and our anxiety product, Daylight. And this is the first rollout of its kind to take place anywhere in the world. And for the whole population of Scotland, Sleepio and Daylight can be accessed via primary care, uh, through psychologists, through link workers, social prescribers, and also through self-referral. So you can see in that map on the right of Scotland, uh, for, for where I'm, uh, I live and I'm from, um, you can see these dots which show regions where people are accessing it, the dark blue being for, for daylight and the light blue, some of which are obscured for Sleepio. And you can see you're getting nationwide coverage, but also being able to get access to the, the Outer Hebrides and the, the Highlands, where typically it would be probably pretty difficult to be able to get access to um, a psychologist relatively quickly. So we can see that digital therapy Products are offering a way for people to access um, quite easily to evidence-based therapeutics so they're not having to wait uh, a long time in, until they can get a referral to see a psychologist. But I know many people have been asking, and I've seen this a lot over the past few years, and I've been asked it quite a few times, will digital therapeutics replace clinicians and therapists? So there have been some alarm bells ringing in the past kind of couple of years, really throughout the pandemic, as I've seen um, an increase in technology being used. Um, that could we all get replaced? But I would actually strongly argue against this. We've seen that medicine has had to adapt with technology. We've had to use technology and they do on a daily basis. So I would envisage that digital therapeutics will be to psychologists as things like surgical robots or laparoscopic tools are to surgeons. It's a tool there for them to use to help make the care more efficient and effective uh, while improving treatment outcomes. Um, that means that a surgery that previously might have taken maybe four hours uh, using kind of cutting someone open and having a standard uh, kind of open surgery might only take maybe 30 minutes to an hour with the laparoscopic approach. So I think therefore we can almost, it might not be a perfect analogy, but we can kind of consider digital therapeutics as a way for psychologists and mental health capabilities. 
um, rather than replace them. So I'll walk through my thinking on the next slide. So here um, we have a, a pyramid which is representing step care. Now step care models have been used um, in a range of populations, but in the context of insomnia, it was proposed back in 2009 uh, in this format by uh, Colin Espy. And it, it, through that, he sought to kind of provide a, a way of, of feasibly uh, allowing access to care at population scale that not only allows um, efficient uh, allocation of uh, resources, but also ensures that patients are getting the, the treatment that they need. So step care, of course, as is seen here, is often conceptualized as a pyramid consisting of different levels, with at the bottom the least specialized care um, for those who might have a more uh, mild complaint or an, an easy to treat complaint. But then those with more severe, complex and rare pot problems get um, triaged further up uh, to the, the point of the pyramid so that then they're getting care that meets uh, the requirements of their presenting complaint. So here it might be if someone's got extremely severe um, insomnia that's uh, not responding to other treatments, um, they may get the very top of the pyramid CBT delivered by a behavioral sleep medicine specialist. Um, and I said the bottom tier of the pyramid should be a treatment that uses the least level of resources and is one that is safe and effective. So historically, this might have been self-help books um, or even sleep hygiene, the, the latter of which we know uh, is not effective. But I think now digital therapeutics can fill this space um, as they have considerable scalability, particularly when fully automated, but they are also evidence-based. And this would allow, therefore, patients who are entering the, the bottom of the funnel to be receiving uh, first-line treatment rather than a, a treatment that, that is subpar. But as you can see, there's this um, kind of sloped line going up on the left-hand side. And I, I would think that we shouldn't just be offering digital CBT to those at the bottom of the pyramid. As I said, there, there's different formats of digital CBT, fully automated, such as Sleepio, or guided, or even digital CBT as support. And I think it's where throughout the pyramid, you could see people being uh, continuing to use digital CBT, say, between sessions with a therapist, in order to ensure that they're getting support between uh, those, those weekly or bi-weekly sessions. Um, and it's a way that allows them to, to have access to, to care um, as and when they, they need it. So I know that that's us uh, just coming up to time. Uh, so I just want to walk through a summary of, of what we've kind of covered today. So firstly, digital CBT and digital therapeutics have the potential to provide scalable access to evidence-based and guideline concordant care. And data shows that it is an effective and safe means of delivering CBT and that it works across a range of clinical and demographic groups, as was shown through that uh, moderation uh, analysis. And we also know that, of course, it, it, Sleepio and digital CPT works beyond the, the typical kind of nighttime complaints that um, most people would think are the, the core symptoms of insomnia. It works on those other daytime symptoms and those uh, broader mental health complaints as well. And then finally, it can be easily integrated within current practice, as we've seen within uh, the Thames Valley rollout, where we looked at the um, cost effectiveness of Sleepio, but also as we're seeing in the real world happening in Scotland at, at the present time. And it can be easily integrated in that, that works being led by our uh, incredible UK focused NHS team. And then if we think about the wider kind of future of this, if we begin to try and structure insomnia uh, treatment uh, within a step care approach, then we can actually potentially look to be more efficient in how we're allocating care and ensure that people are getting the, the care and treatment that they need in a timely manner. So I'd like to thank everyone for, for listening today. Uh, I'm happy now. I think we've got a uh, period of, of questions I'll do my best to answer them uh, but as a reminder I don't have all the answers as much as I wish I did so thank you very much.